Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's hearing. We're going to continue hearing the evidence of Mr. Albon. So my first task, as always, is to check that Mr. Albon is there and can see me and hear me clearly. Mr. Albon, are you there? Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Is there anything you'd like to raise with me before we carry on? No, thank you. So you're ready to go on and I'll invite Miss Grange to carry on putting questions to you, if I may. Yes, Miss Grange. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, yes, properly, good afternoon, Mr. Alban. Um, we go back to your third uh, witness statement at this point, BBA 30010751, page two. I want to look at paragraph seven again. So we, we looked at this paragraph earlier and I've asked you some questions about uh, Ms. Sharma, who you are describing in the second sentence. And if I can look at uh, what you say from the third line up from the bottom, you say, and she and the BBA senior scientist have made a number of presentations to project managers on fire related issues with respect to product certification and you exhibit copies of these presentations. Now, can you help us exactly when were those presentations delivered? Do you know that? I can't give you specific dates. Um, it is a rolling program in that when we have a, an intake of new project managers, we will give these presentations on a fairly regular basis so that new staff are given the same training as existing staff, but it's as and when required as opposed to on a, a six monthly basis or whatever. Right, I, I see. So this is these are presentations primarily targeted at new staff, is that correct? When first introduced, it was for existing staff, but obviously on a rolling basis, they are repeated so that everyone has the same information. Yeah, I see. And, um, Upon checking your exhibit, JA28, that you refer to there, there appear to be only two presentations with any fire-related content, and they appear to be dated 2011-2012 and uh, April 2016. Let, let's just bring those up. This is BBA 3010762. And if we look first at page five, This is the first um, of the presentations. If we can z zoom in on the top left-hand corner, we can see it says fire presentation 2011 updated December 2012. So we have that one. And then there's an April 2016 one at page seven. We can see the date of this one at page seven of your exhibit. Um, in the top left-hand triangle, John Denyer, Principal Scientist, Nisha Sharma, Project Manager and Tech Coordinator Fire, 26th of April, 2016. Now, um, can you help us with this? Were there any such presentations before 2012? Not that I'm aware of, I, I don't remember. Right, so it's possible, is it, that these are the well, the, the one we saw before, the 2011-2012 one, that that's the first such fire presentation that was uh, delivered within the BBA, yes? Possibly. Yeah, okay. If we uh, look at your third witness statement uh, at this point, this is um, BBA 3010751, page four, and I want to look at paragraph 12. You say this, you say, over the period under consideration, the BBA had in place a consultancy agreement with Exova Warrington Fire. This organization was known by several names over this period. This allowed the BBA to seek expert consultancy on particular fire issues, where it was considered that these fell outside of the BBA's competence to address internally. Um, now, 
if we go back um, to your exhibit JA28, that's at BBA 3010762. If we go to um, page one, this is the fire presentation. And we looked just a moment ago at page five, which was the date of this presentation. And then, so the, I think it's right. Can you help us that these notes appear to go with that uh, slideshow, is that correct? They, they appear to match. I don't know, I would, I would need to look at them in detail. If, I see. If you say so, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. Um, if we go to page four, back into the slides, and we look at the bottom left hand side of these slides. Uh, it, it tells us uh, item one at the bottom, the BBA has a consultancy agreement with Warrington, whereby under a monthly fee arrangement, advice is available free of individual charge. As a result, Warrington should always be consulted before BRE, although BRE can carry out certain tests that Warrington do not offer. So that appears to be what you're telling staff, we think in 2011, 2012. Does that, does that sound right to you? It's a little earlier than I think I said earlier. Um, yes, it's reasonable. Right. When did you think that that arrangement with Warrington came into being? I thought it was slightly later, but clearly not. Yeah. So it's right, is it, that the BBA entered into a consultancy agreement with Warrington or Exova Warrington Fire, but not the BRE. That's correct, yes? Yes. Was there ever a written agreement between the BBA and Warrington? Yes. It says that the agreement was uh, for a monthly fee arrangement and advice was available free of charge. Does that mean that the consultancy agreement was a kind of retainer? The BBA would pay a flat fee and Warrington would provide advice at any time. Is that how it worked? Yes. And what about if advice was sought from the BRE? Would the BBA at that time have been paying for advice from the BRE? We did still have conversations with BRE on an informal basis. If there had been a substantial piece of work that we asked the BRE to carry out, I would expect us to have been charged for it. I see. So to take an example that we'll come back to, when Mr. Haynes speaks to um, Sarah Colwell, that was Mr. Gregorian's evidence, and picked up the phone and asked us some questions about the first Rainer Bond certificate. Would that be just free of charge advice that the BRE were providing in good faith? I don't know, I wasn't involved. Um, the BA and BRE share a site. Um, we have long established working relationships. In some cases, I believe Brian Haynes knew Sarah Colwell through committee work. It may be they had an informal basis, but I really don't know. Right, yes. And you've just confirmed there that it's right, isn't it, that the, B, the BBA and the BRE are located on the same site in Watford. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And, and how far apart are your offices? It's a large site. Um, certainly walking distance. Right, yeah. Was the arrangement, can you help us, with Warrington in place in 2007 when Mr Gregorian was working on the first Rainer Bond certificate assessment? I'm not sure, but I don't think so. Right. Miss Amoroso, when she gave oral evidence, said that she was unaware of any formal consultancy arrangement with Warrington uh, or Warrington Fire or Exova. That was day 106 pages 19 and 20. She started at the BBA in November 2014 and she worked through to July 2018. Can you help us understand why Ms Amoroso as project manager uh, was unaware of that formal consultancy arrangement with, the, with Warrington Fire? No, I would be very surprised if that she wasn't aware. Why would you be very surprised that she wasn't aware? 
because I thought we had communicated this to all project managers, but clearly not. Right. Um, we have not found any evidence of contact with Warrington Fire or Exova regarding the initial assessment of Rainabon 55 uh, panels, nor have we found any evidence of contact during any of the subsequent uh, reviews of, of that uh, product. Um, are you aware, can you help us, whether Warrington Fire Exova ever assessed any aspects of the statements about fire performance made in Certificate 084510 for the Rainabon panels? I have seen nothing on the retained files to suggest there was any such correspondence. As I was just mentioning, we, we did see some evidence, and we'll come to these emails specifically, of emails being sent to Sarah Colwell of the BRE on fire performance, uh, relating specifically to the fire performance of the back face of the panels. Um, can you help us? Would you have expected the BRE, or indeed Exova, to have reviewed all of the statements made on Certificate 084510 about fire performance, before that certificate was issued? No, that would not be normal practice. And can you explain why that wasn't normal practice? It would be normal practice if we felt it was outside of the expertise available to us within the BBA to ask for external advice. In this case, apparently we did not feel that was necessary. And can you help us, um, would that not have been normal because statements about fire performance were considered to be within the capabilities of the BBA staff who were drafting and reviewing the certificate? That would be reviewed on a case by case basis. Um, in this case, the technical manager would decide whether or not the draft should be circulated externally. If he felt that we had the internal competence, clearly that wouldn't be necessary. In your experience, how common would it be for a draft certificate to be circulated to external fire experts by the BBA? Most product types would have been assessed before they would be circulated on the first certificates of a given type. Thereafter, if the wording, product and use are very similar, we wouldn't see the need to circulate it again. So relatively uncommon. Right. And where you say most product types would have been assessed before they would be circulated on the first certificate, who, who would it have been assessed by? I didn't explain that very well, sorry. Um, we try to maintain, if you like, a level playing field for any given type of certificate. So if we have a similar product being used for the same use, we have a certificate template which sets out the wording to be used. Um, it's not a cut and paste exercise, but it's a template. And that is established by circulation on the first certification of that product type. Once the wording has been agreed and established, there seems no point in just circulating it a second time, provided that the wording is appropriate. I see. And can you help us, you may not be able to, but can you help us as to whether such a template existed to assist with the drafting of the first Rainer Bond certificate in, that came out in 2008? I don't know what you find on the certificate traveller log, which would be on the file. Right. Um, Going back to the, the presentations you exhibited uh, at BBA 3010762, we've seen that there's a second presentation dated April 2016. This is at page seven of that, BBA 3010762, page seven. So we can see that the, the title of this presentation um, is fire safety part B and fire presentation. Do you see that in the little red rhombus at the top of that page? Yes. And um, so this appears to be 
directed at part B of the building regulations. And you can see that on the right hand side of the page, if we come back out again, there's a heading, pan back out. Yeah, building regulations, current regulations, sources of approved documents, part B, fire safety, principal aims, statutory instruments, fire safety requirements. So we saw that this is training from April, 2016. And if we go to page 15, we can see at the very top of that page, it explains fire safety part B and fire presentation. This presentation is part of fundamentals training program, which commenced in February, 2016. All PAC staff with less than three years experience at the BBA are required to attend. In addition to staff working in the area under consideration. Now, can you help us? What was it that prompted the BBA to in to institute this particular training program in February 2016? I'm not aware of any particular catalyst, if you like, that started it. Um, we, we try to operate a process of continuous improvement within the BBA. We have the technical excellence team or the technical team at the time, one of whose roles is training of staff, technical training of staff. So I imagine we decided it would be an idea to formalize the training and improve the training that we had in place at that time. Can you help us? What is meant by PAC staff? It says that all PAC staff with less than three years experience are required to attend. What's meant by PAC staff? It's an abbreviation for product approval and certification. Um, right. these, are the, these are the staff that, the technical staff that work on producing certificates. And can you help us as to why we don't see a training package like this on the building regulations relevant to fire and fire safety uh, before this time? As I say, we, we have a process of continuous improvement. There was training for staff before this time, it was less formalized and we decided to introduce, if you like, a better process through this series of presentations. And the training for staff before this time, was that the on the job training you were referring to earlier? Yes. Yes. Now, just finally on this topic, if we can go to a, a later document than this, this is BBA 301486. This is a memo, uh, it, it seems to be a, a kind of position paper. It was drafted, we believe, for the EBA board. It's dated the 20th of June, 2017. And we can see the authors, if we go to page five of this document, you can see the authors, it, it, you are there together with Jordan Adams and Brian Moore. Who was Jordan Adams? She was, um an administrator, a manager of the administrators in our audit and inspection team. Right. Now we'll come back to look at this memo later in your evidence, but just for now, I want to look at page one, paragraph three. And at the beginning of that paragraph three, it says there, um, the BBA does not have in-house fire experts on a national scale and relies on external consultancy for research issues. But we do have significant experience of interpreting the requirements of the building regulations and can make judgments on such compliance with some confidence. Can you just help us, what, what did you mean in the first line? Sorry, I ought to clarify. Did you actually draft this document? Yes. Yes. Well, I say yes, yes, in consultation with Brian Moore. Yes, thank you. And where you say in the first line that the BBA does not have in-house fire experts on a national scale, can you help us as to what you meant by that? As I tried to explain earlier, we have a very narrow focus on the interpretation of fire and the application of fire within the BBA relating to the requirements of the approved documents and equivalent documents for the rest of the UK. We are not fire experts in any other sense. I see. 
but you are certifying products in relation to their fire performance, yes? Yes. Yes. And where you say in, in that paragraph three that it relies on external consultancy for research issues, what does that mean? We would be competent to take a UCAS accredited fire laboratory test report and assess that classification in relation to the requirements of the national building regulations. If there were wider judgments to be made, perhaps if the scope of that document did not cover the scope of the products that we were actually assessing, we would not be competent to expand the scope of that classification. And in that situation, we would seek external advice. I see. What about being competent to notice if there was fire performance information missing? Would you consider that the BBA was competent in that regard? Could you be more specific? Well, I think it'd be better. Let, we'll come to it when we get to the Rainer Bond certificate in a moment, but, and I'll ask you some specific questions on that. Um, can you just, with reference to paragraph three here, can you explain how the BBA was able to make authoritative assessments about the fire performance of construction products and materials without having in-house fire expertise? I would argue that we do have in-house fire expertise that is appropriate to the role that we perform. We know the limits of our competency and if we are required to go beyond those limits, we will seek external advice. I see. The way that's written there, you say we rely on external consultancy for research issues. That doesn't sound like you rely on the exter those external consultancy for routine queries that crop up as part of your certification assessments. Is that fair? We have a very good understanding of the depths of our competency. We will make judgments within that competency. We will not go outside what we understand. In those circumstances, we will seek advice. Did you ever question whether you needed to bolster your expertise in fire performance and fire safety matters? We are always looking to bolster the experience and competency of individuals within the BBA. We are not a fire test house. We, we do not intend to carry out fire testing. So we staff the organization on the basis of the knowledge that we need to carry out the work that we undertake. Yes, let me put it a different way. Did there ever come a time when you became aware that the BBA was lacking in terms of its ability to interpret fire test information? There are limits, yes, and this is the reason we put the um, consultancy arrangement in place with Exova Warrington, so that we could obtain specialist advice when we needed it. But what about after that time? For example, and we'll come to it in detail later, when Mr Martin of the DCLG intervenes in July 2014, pointing out serious errors with the K-15 Kingspan certificate. At that point, did anybody within the B BBA ask itself the question, are we competent to be certifying on fire performance issues? We are continually reviewing the competence of the organisation. This forms part of our annual appraisal process. And yes, we were aware of the limits of our knowledge. We had put in place a mechanism whereby we could obtain additional knowledge as and when we required it, because we are in full recognition of the limits of our competency. There would be little point in our employing a number of highly qualified fire engineers when our routine day-to-day -day business does not require that expertise. Yes, I don't think that's quite an answer to my question, but can I go back to it? At that point, so this is July 2014, did anybody within the BBA ask itself the question, are we competent to be certifying on fire performance issues? 
why would we ask that question? What's, what specific question should we be asking ourselves? Sorry, I, I don't understand the line of questioning. I see. What I'm getting at is when you became aware in July 2014, and we'll come to it, you, do, you, do you remember when Mr. Martin got in touch with you about K-15? Yes? So I think you said Sorry, yes. 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 What I'm getting at is at that time, did you seriously question the competency of the BBA on certifying fire performance of, of products? We carried out an in-house investigation. Um, we established what had happened, the reason it had happened, and the likelihood of it recurring. And I, or we, were satisfied that we had the necessary experience and that that would not happen again. So to answer your question, I suppose, yes, we did. I see. Okay. Let's move on now. Um, and I'm going to ask you some questions, more specific questions now about the Rainer Bond certificate, certificate 08 slash 450. Now in 2007, 2008, when the Rainer Bond product was first assessed and certified, you were in a different department. Is that right? Yes. You were section head of the materials department at that point. Is that correct? Yes. And you tell us in your witness statement, we don't need to go to it. This is paragraph 16 of your second witness statement that you were not responsible for the technical content of that certificate as this fell within the scope of another technical department, yes? I supplied some specialist internal consultancy relating to the durability of the coating. I also, I think, sent an email relating to the possible contribution of colour to the fire classification. Other than that, no. Yes, thank you. Um, but is it right that responsibility for this certificate did subsequently come under your remit? Uh, in particular that, uh, well, to this extent, that the processes and procedures relating to this certificate would have come under your remit from 2009 after you became technical manager, is that correct? Not for that specific certificate in the context I think you're applying. I was responsible for the processes, policies and procedures of the organisation as a whole. I did not have responsibility for that individual certificate. No, I understand that. But in terms of, say, the procedure of reviewing the certificate, you had overall responsibility within the BBA for that procedure, yes? Yes. Yes. And for any policies or practices surrounding the review of BBA certificates, yes? Yes. Yes, thank you. Now, you do tell us in your first witness statement, if we can go to that uh, page one, paragraph one, this is BBA 50158. We look at that paragraph, you tell us you're a senior technical manager at the BBA, that's in the top line. And then three lines down, you say, I'm therefore well placed to comment on the BBA certificate issued for the Rainer Bond PE and FR products to explain the technical assessment processes leading to their issue and the subsequent surveillance procedures operated in order to maintain their validity. And um, it's right, isn't it, that you did have, as you've already just explained, some limited involvement in the original certification process, yes? Yes. And you were also involved, were you not, directly in review processes related to that certificate in 2017, is that right? I don't think so. Um, I, I was responsible for the principles. Um, I, right. I'm not sure I was involved in the specifics of that particular review. Okay, well, we'll, we'll come on to that. Okay. Um, can we just go to that BBA certificate, BBA 6047? This is the, the first issue of the certificate. It's dated right at the bottom of the page, 14th of January, 2008. Um, and it's a certificate that uh, we are familiar with now. Can I take it that you are also familiar with that 
certificate that you have looked at that prior to giving evidence to us today? Yes. Yes. In which case, I'm not going to go through it just in general now. Um, can you remember when you first uh, read this certificate? I think it was immediately in the aftermath of the Grenfell fire. Right. So that was the first time you actually came to look at this particular certificate. Is that correct? I, I can't honestly say I wasn't aware of it previously. I'm, I can't remember having read it previously. There is little reason why I would have done. Right. So you didn't ever have reason to check the technical content of this certificate prior to that time? Um, no, this would have been in a different department. Yeah. Now we know that Arconic's interactions with the BBA regarding the certificate began in 2004. And I want to pick up the story with you in 2006. Now in June 2006, Mr. Verla sent some documents to you if we can go within Mr. Verla's exhibits, uh, this is MET 30053158 underscore P14 at page 35. So we can see this is an email to you from Mr. Verla. It's dated the 7th of June, 2006. The, the date reads in the, with the um, month first and then the, the day. And he says, uh, just dear Mr. Alban, please find enclosed the French Avi Technique System Rivet. Do you see that there? Yes. And attached is a document, if we go to page 36 in this same exhibit, next page. And attached was the AVI Technique report from the CSTB. We can see it's the CSTB in the bottom left and we can see it's for the rivet system. Do you see that? Yes. And we know that means the riveted uh, Rainabon fabrication method. And if we can go to uh, page 98 of this exhibit, this is your email in response. So this is uh, on the 8th of June, 2006, you reply and you say, thank you for sending the information. I hope to examine the two sets of data in the next few days and we'll send you a fuller response then. And then if we go to page 99 of this exhibit, there's a further email from you in response at the top of that page. And this is on the 13th of June, 2006. And you say, sorry for the delay in replying to you on this. It would appear that the documents supplied would be useful to us in any future BBA assessments of the type that we discussed during my visit. Unfortunately, we would need to have English translations before we could be sure how much of the information is relevant. Should you decide to proceed with any of the proposed BBA assessments, could you please supply us with translations so that we can ensure that we take full account of the existing data. And we can see that you sign off as section head in, in that email, yes? Yes. Now we know that there were two AVI technique reports for Rainer Bond at this time. One was for the rivet fix uh, system and one was for the cassettes, the cassette method of fabrication. And you refer in your email, we just saw it, uh, of the 8th of June, 2006, just looking back at that, page 98, we saw there that you refer to two sets of data. You say in that second sentence, I hope to examine the two sets of data in the next few days. Uh, can you help us? And we appreciate it is a long time ago. Are you referring there to the two separate AVI technique reports? I'm sorry, I don't know. It was 15 years ago. No yeah. There is reference uh, as well to a, a visit. Um, we saw we see we see that we saw that on page 99. If we just go back to that, in your slightly fuller response, you say in that second paragraph, 
um, the documents would be useful um, in any future BA, BA assessments of the type that we discussed during my visit. Um, can you remember anything about that visit? Yes, um, we discussed my career progression briefly earlier. Um, at one time, I was a BBA inspector carrying out factory inspections. Um, we had a slight issue with resourcing, although I had moved to or back to um, the technical assessment team, I retained the ability to carry out factory inspections in exceptional circumstances where, for whatever reason, the normal BBA inspection staff were not available. This was a routine factory visit that I carried out for an existing um, Arconic, Arconic certificate. Um, and it was purely a factory audit. Right, I see. Can you remember which existing um, Arconic product you were auditing at that time? It was an aluminium coil coated product. Aluminium coil coated. Can you explain exactly what an aluminium coil coated product is? Yes, it's, it's as it as it sounds. It's a coil um, of aluminium, a very large coil of aluminium that is painted on both sides and supplied to site as a coil, which is subsequently fabricated by specialist fabricators as roofing or cladding. Right. Thank you. Um, and can you uh, help us, did you discuss during that factory visit Arconic applying for a BBA certificate for its Rainer Bond panels? It would appear so from this email, I don't remember the conversation I'm afraid. Yeah. And to the best of your recollection, was Mr. Verla providing these CSTB reports to you to see if a BBA certificate could be based on them? Possibly, as I say, I don't remember the details, but that's certainly a possibility. And just to be clear, is that what meant? Is that what's meant by a confirmation certificate? The BBA confirms the data of another body. Yes. And the CSTB in France was one of those bodies from whom the BBA would accept data as being technically sound, yes? Yes. And was it cheaper for an applicant to get a confirmation certificate if it was based on uh, other data? Was that a less expensive process? Yes, it was. Now, after this, Arconic sent an uh, an application form in August 2006. Um, now, in terms of the just the process generally, I think it's your evidence, is this right, that it's up to the client to decide what products are being assessed. The BBA itself doesn't decide, it's the client to decide what the product is that's to be assessed. Is that correct? The client will request this, yes. And I think you also say in your statements that uh, it is what the client writes in the application form that the BBA takes as the product which the client wishes to have assessed, yes? Yes. But is it right that the BBA would not just take statements made in the application form as being final? Would the BBA always consider the underlying and supporting data to determine what product it was appropriate to be certifying? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Could you explain, please? So in terms of what product the certificate actually covered, would it be a matter for the BBA to determine once it had looked at all the underlying and supporting data, what product they fe felt able to cover in the certificate? Yes, we would normally carry out an assessment of the product defined for the purpose for which it was defined, unless we had a good reason why that wouldn't be appropriate. Right, yes. Now, if we look at the 2006 application form in Claude Berla's exhibits, this is MET 30053158 underscore P13, at page 167.
That's the cover page of their 2006 application form. And this was materially identical to an application that they'd made in 2004. And if we go to page 173 of this form, we can see a table of available assessment, calculation and test data. And in the first two rows of that, we can see AVI technique reports. Uh, and it says uh, characteristic covered. Uh, and then someone's written structural and system for cassettes and underneath that structural and system for rivet, riveted. Now, do you remember seeing this application form at the time? No. Now, but this tells us on the face of it, doesn't it, that uh, the CSTB considered it appropriate to treat the riveted and the cassette product separately, yes? I would expect the CSTB would have a very similar process to that at the BBA, whereby they would assess what they were asked to assess by their client. Yes. But can we agree it was clear from the face of the form on this form that AVI Technique had produced separate reports for the cassettes and for the rivets, yes? Yes. Now those AVI Technique reports, they do deal with fire performance uh, under the French national system. I just want to show you that. If we go within part 14 of Mr. Verla's exhibits, MET, 3053158 underscore P14 at page 10. <coughs> so this is the AVI, this is within the AVI technique report for the cassette. Um, and what we see in the right hand column is that there is a heading just around the middle of the page on fire safety. Can you see that? Yes. Can we zoom into that? Yes, that's helpful. So these AVI technique reports did have some fire safety information in them, even though Arconic was not relying on that particular fire safety information in its application to the BBA. And what we can see if we go two paragraphs down under fire safety, as it says, the fire reaction classification of the wall used is M1 for all plate thicknesses. Do you see that? Yes. So we can see under the French system, the cassettes have M1 classification. And then if we go within this to page 65, This is, uh, in contrast, the AVI technique for the riveted system. You can see that, uh, just to be clear, under 1.1 in the top left, it says uh, external wall overcladding fixed by rivets to a, flaming, a framing of aluminium sections. And then if we go on the right-hand side under fire safety, in the second paragraph down, you can see that it says under the first bullet, the, the fire reaction rating of the baked enamel panels is M1 to M3, according to the covering used. Do you see that? Yes. So there's different parts of the French national fire classification system being quoted for the cassette versus the rivet, yes? Well, it seems to say according to the covering used rather than the method, but yes. Yes, now, would you have expected a project manager who was provided with all this information to have read it all thoroughly, including this AVI technique report? No, that's not how the confirmation process works. The confirmation process does not copy the content of the overseas certificate. It takes the base data on which that certificate was based and carries out an assessment of that underpinning data. It is not a rubber stamp exercise. It's a separate assessment carried out on the same set of data. 
Yes, Mr. Alvin, I think you've misunderstood my question. I, I wasn't asking whether it was a rubber stamping exercise or whether the information was simply copied. The question I asked was, would you have expected a project manager who's provided with all this information to have read it thoroughly, including this AVI technique report? Yes. And would you have expected anybody supervising that project manager, such as Brian Haynes or Jeff Gurney, who was head of the relevant engineering assessment section, would you have expected them to have at least seen the application form? Yes. And what about, would you have expected them to have read all the underlying reports that were put forward? Possibly, it will depend on the context. I, I wouldn't expect them to take any real recognition of the French National Fire Classification System. Why not? Because it is irrelevant to the UK regulatory system, which requires either a British or a European standard. We have no knowledge of this French classification system. Would you have expected them to have noticed that the panels had different French national fire classifications, even if they didn't know the detail of what those French tests were? They may have noticed, but I would, I would question the relevance. The relevant classification systems would be those defined in the UK building regulations. Well, might the relevance have been to suggest that the panels performed differently in fire, depending on whether they were cassettes or rivets? We were not certifying cassettes or rivets, though. We were certifying the sheet. I see. Your evidence, uh, and I think we see this from your statements, and we'll come back to it, is that that certificate merely covers a flat panel, yes? That was my interpretation of the documents on the file, yes. When you say that was my interpretation of the documents on the file, when, when did you do that interpretation exercise? I think it would have been when I was asked for a statement by the inquiry. Right. Let's go to Claude Verla's exhibits um, in part 14 now um, again. So this is MET 3053158 underscore P14 page 114. This is an internal archonic visit report. So you probably won't have seen this before. Um, we can see it relates to a visit. The, the date of the visit is Thursday, the 2nd of November, 2006. And I think elsewhere we're told that this was prepared just shortly after that on the 6th of November, 2006. And it concerns a meeting that the archonic had with the BBA in Watford on the 2nd of November, 2006. And we can see in that um, top section of this visit report that those that were present included Bob Keyes, business manager, and then you are present, John Alban, technical manager, and Mr. Gregorian, the engineering system department, yes? Yes, although I was not technical manager at that point, that's a mistake. Uh, what was your... Um, what was your job title at that point? I believe I was section head at that point. Yes. Section head of the materials department, yes? Yes. Yeah. And for Arconic, we can see that present on the right-hand side of that same row was Colin Southgate and Andrew Rich. Yes? Yes. Do you remember that visit that Arconic uh, made to Watford in November 2006? I remember meeting uh, uh, Colin Southgate um, I don't remember Andrew Rich, so possibly not this meeting, no. Right. If we look at item one, we can see it says reason for the visit, exploratory call to assess situation as follows with Claude Verla in attendance. Um, one possibility is that Mr. Verla wasn't physically in attendance, but perhaps was in attendance some other way, perhaps by telephone. Can you help us on that? 
sorry, no, I don't remember. Yeah, and we can see that the two points uh, as the reason for the visit are investigate adding DG 5000 paint system to current BBA cert 87-1964, and then number two, negotiate Rainer Bond 55 proposal sent 22nd of August 06, value around 20,000 pounds. Now, and then at point two, under details of visit, it says this, after a general discussion with BK and, and CS, threat to stop all dealings with BBA, unless a satisfactory solution was found, we both the above potential approvals. BK had arranged for the BBA persons responsible to be in attendance. That seems to be uh, Bob Keyes is BK there. Um, now, do you recall anyone at Arconic threatening to stop dealing with the BBA at a meeting around this time? No. You can't recall that at all? I don't remember it. No. What we see then underneath that is uh, a heading meeting A, and it says RLX, is that Rainalux? Can you help us? Presumably, yes. Yes. Were you involved with the Rainalux project product at this time? Um, looking at this document, it appears to be related to certificate eighty-seven one nine six four. Yeah. Which was the coral coating certificate I was referring to earlier. Um, yeah. That did fall under the responsibility of my team. Right. That was under the Department for Materials. Yes. yes. Yeah. I see. Um, and then if we, so that's meeting A and we can see some notes, we don't need to go through them, where your initial is mentioned. So you appear to be active in that part of the meeting. And then if we go over the page to 115, we can see that there's meeting B, which is about the Rainabon 55 proposal from August, 2006. And it says with Hamo Gregorian, um, it may, may be from your previous answers, you can't help at all, but do you know whether you were present at meeting B or just meeting A? I'm sorry, I don't remember. It, it's possible yeah. I was in meeting B, I don't know. Right. Do you remember contributing at all to a discussion about Rainer Bond panels in part B of the meeting? No. Okay. Just staying with this just for a moment, just to check whether th this might jog any memory. Um, in the second paragraph under um, meeting B, so you can see there's a line beginning, I have suggested, it says, I have suggested it could be better to validate the material on rather than the whole system. This way a cross connection can be put together. BBA certification for four millimeter thick Rainabon 55 material, CSTB certification for Rainabon plus systems. This way our two products materials, Rainer Lux and Rainer Bond can be approved on paper, which will cover most needs such as the NHBC, NBS organizations. Now, does that help as to whether you can recollect a discussion along those lines about um, certifying or validating the material Rainer Bond rather than the whole system? I'm sorry, I, I don't remember. You can't help us as to what that discussion was about? No, I'm sorry. Can you recall ever being told what had been agreed about what was actually to be covered in the Rainer Bond certificate? Are you able to help us with that? I don't think I would have been aware my, my input was restricted to the performance of the material itself. I wouldn't have been consulted on the structural aspects. I see. Is it your understanding that the BBA agreed to certify the Rainer Bond product without it being linked to a specific cladding system? 
I should emphasize I was not involved in this. All I have the opportunity to do is to review the documents, but from the contract documents, that is how I would interpret it. It was the material, not the system. And does that mean that it's your interpretation that the BBA agreed to certify the, the panel as a raw flat panel product, regardless of how it was fabricated? That is how I have interpreted it, yes. And that understanding, just to be clear, is what? From your reading of the documents on the file, yes? Yes. Right. Just some, some general principles now about what these certificates are, are intending to do. Can we look at your second witness statement, page uh, eight, that's BBA 3010723, page eight. <clears throat> And if we look at paragraph 22, you tell us there that a BBA certificate is an expression of the BBA's opinion of the fitness for purpose of a product for a defined purpose. And you say something very similar in your third statement. If we could go to that page 11, BBA 3010751, page 11. So in um, 37, right at the bottom of that page, you tell us, it is my understanding that a certificate holder will use a certificate as an independent means of demonstrating their product's fitness for its intended purpose to potential customers. And um, that's what the BBA certify in the certificate itself. That's right, isn't it? its fitness for its intended purpose. Yes. If we look, for example, at, at this Rainer Bond certificate, uh, BBA 50, sorry, 6047. In the blue box, immediately above the signature at the bottom of that page, we can see the words there. The BBA has awarded this Agramon certificate for Rainer Bond architectural wall cladding panels to Alcoa as fit for their intended use, provided they are installed, used and maintained as set out in this Agramon certificate, yes? Yes. And is it right that by providing an independent assessment of a product's fitness for its intended use, the BBA certificates play an important role in establishing the construction industry, enabling the construction industry to meet the requirements of Regulation 7 of the Building Regulations 1984, which requires adequate, sorry, 2010, which requires adequate and proper materials to be used, which are appropriate for the circumstances in which they are used. It is one of the ways that compliance with Regulation 7 can be demonstrated, yes. Yes. And, and, and following on from that, certification by the BBA is a recognised and established scheme for the independent certification of construction products in accordance with the requirements of approved document B, yes? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yes, that certification by the BBA is a recognised and established scheme for the independent certification of construction products in accordance with the requirements of approved document B, for example. Well, approved document B is, is one aspect. The BBA certificate is an overall statement of fitness for purpose, taking all aspects into account. So it is not specific to approved document B or any other of the approved documents. But is certification by the BBA a recognized and establish scheme for the independent certification of products. Yes. Now, in terms of the specific product we're considering here, it's right, isn't it, that Rainer Bond 55 cannot be used unless it is fabricated into a rivet fix or a cassette fix. Yes. And in fact, the material itself was unusable unless it was fabricated. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And can we agree, therefore, that in order to make any statement about Rainer Bond in a BBA certificate, 
the BBA would have to consider that purpose, namely that it was always going to be a fabricated product. Yes. And isn't it, or doesn't it follow from that, that any technical claims made in the certificate issued by the BBA to Arconic would, unless otherwise stated, be taken by a reader of the certificate to apply to the panels irrespective of the manner of their fabrication or installation? No, that would depend on the specific text of the certificate. The scope of the certification is de defined within the certificate and it is individual. Do you know whether the BBA appreciated at the time that the fabricated form of a panel can have a significant effect on its technical performance, including its fire performance? I don't know, but there is nothing on the fire, oh, excuse me, nothing on the file to suggest that. Well, there was, wasn't there? We've just seen it. The CSTB reports, the Abbey Technique reports on the file gave different French classifications for the rivet and for the cassette. As yeah. I've explained, we would not consider the French classification system because that has no relevance in the UK regulatory environment. So you wouldn't expect where this is a uh, confirmation certificate and you're confirming fire test information that's been provided by, say, the CSTB, you wouldn't expect the BBA to be able to have some appreciation of the French national classification system? No, it is completely irrelevant in the UK environment. The requirements for the BBA are set out in the contracts produced and they will define the fire test data that is required to carry out the assessment. We would not be supplied with copies of the fire test reports supporting the French classification system. They won't be on our files and there is no reason why we would want them. They are irrelevant. Well, I was just focusing on the information that you were provided with that we've just looked at. Um, but just going back to the point I was on just a moment before that, um, did the BBA appreciate at this time that the geometry really matters, that there can be substantial differences in a product's fire performance depending on its shape? That's not an assumption we would make. We would ask for the fire test data relating to the products that are to be assessed. We would not make an assumption without data. Yes, that's not an answer to my question. I'm gonna put it again. Did the BBA appreciate at this time that the geometry really matters, that there can be substantial differences in a product's fire performance depending on its shape? Clearly the configuration of a sample can have an effect on the performance in a fire test, yes. Yes. We saw that the CSTB treated rivet and cassette separately in their AVI technique reports. In those circumstances, can we agree that it was obvious that the BBA should check that the two types of fabricated panel did not perform differently? We were not asked to certify the two configurations of the panel, we were asked to certify the plain sheet that is subsequently fabricated. But if you're provided with information relating to only one of those fabrication methods, can we agree that it was incumbent upon the BBA to check that the performance of the other fabricated version was no different? but we weren't certifying the performance of the other fabricated system. We were certifying the performance of the plain sheet. Mr. Gregorian's oral evidence was that the BBA only added reference to the rivets and cassettes in the certificate as details, just to show how the material 
could be used in a cladding system. He said that at day 105, page 81, lines 21 to 23. Now, is, is that your understanding as well? That would seem consistent with the information on the file, yes. When you say that would seem consistent with the information on the file, can you explain what it is on the file that leads you to the conclusion that the BBA only added reference to the rivets and cassettes as details just to show how the material could be used in a cladding system? I'm struggling to give you a specific example. Um, perhaps if we looked at the contract documents, whether they referred to separate rivet and cassette configurations or if they just referred to plain sheet. That is the basis of the assessments, the contents of the formal contract. Right, so are you speculating that there might be something in the formal contract documents that assist as to whether or not the rivets of the cassettes were included in the certificate as mere details, just to show how the material could be used in the cladding system? Well, I'm struggling to give you a specific example on the file because I don't have it in front of me, but the overall impression I formed from a review of that file was that this was the situation. Um, can you help us? You, you, you told us you were familiar with the certificate and we can go back to it if we need to. How is that consistent with the amount of detail that we see on the certificate, including pictures about the rivet and the cassette methods of fixings? If I am correct in my interpretation of the intention of that certificate, I think the inclusion of those illustrations was potentially misleading. Right, so are you accepting that for readers of that certificate that they would have understood that, for example, the statements about fire performance would have applied equally as between the rivet and the cassette products? We were not aware that there was a difference and so there is no differentiation in the certificate, yes. Yes, so are you accepting that for readers of that certificate they would have understood that the statements about fire performance would have applied equally between the rivet and the cassette and thereby the certificate was misleading. I think the data given in the certificate were consistent with those that were made available to the BBA and that they were an accurate reflection of the information that was placed at our disposal. Right. Let's look now at the documents that support the statements which are made on the BBA certificate. Um, if we can return to the BBA certificate, this is BBA 6047, page five. This is the behavior in relation to a fire section. And I just want to start with paragraph 6.2, the second paragraph down there. It says a fire retardant sample of the product with a metallic gray PDF finish when tested in accordance with the S476, achieved a fire propagation index of I of naught and when tested in accordance with 476 part seven, achieved a class one surface spread of flame. Now, can we agree, based on your understanding now and your reading of the file, that it was only the FR, the fire retardant version of the product, for which the BBA had any BS 476 part six and part seven test reports? Yes. And just for the transcript, the reference to that test data is at BBA 408042, page 163 and page 177. Now we know that there were in existence some other BS 476 part six and part seven and class naught summary test results for some of, uh, some of the Rainer Bond products, including something called Rainer Bond 33, which was a signage product and Rainer Bond 160, 
PE. It was a test completed in 1997. Uh, but you have told us in your first in your statement that the BBA were never provided with these. If we look at your first witness statement at page 10, that's BBA 50158, page 10, paragraph 35, you say Dr. Lane's report includes reference to fire reports on Rainer Bond 160 PE and Rainer Bond 33. We have not received any reports relating to those. And then you say this, nor would we expect to, as these were not certified products. By not certified products, do you mean that they were not the products that the BBA was assessing for this certification? Yes. So you wouldn't have expected to have seen those because they related to a different Rainer Bond product, yes? As far as I know, yes. And they would be irrelevant to the certificate because they were for a different product, yes? Unless we received supplementary evidence from an accredited fire organisation that we could use them, in isolation they would be irrelevant, yes. When you say, unless we receive supplementary evidence from an accredited fire organization that we could use them, what does that mean? Sorry, that was very badly expressed. It is sometimes possible that a fire test laboratory will give a letter of opinion on the likely performance of a product relative to the one that we are assessing. So in those circumstances, we may be able to use the reports, but we would not make such a judgment within the BBA. Right. So just to be clear, you wouldn't ever within the BBA make an assessment based on a different product about another product's fire performance, yes? Not if it was a different formulation or specification. If it was the same product just simply renamed, then possibly, but certainly wouldn't. we would not extend the scope of applicability of a fire test report in that way. Right. Now, if we go to the 2007 application form on the technical file, this is at BBA 408042 at page 29. Just looking right at the very top, um, under section 3.1, the standard information that's included here in this application form. It says this, if suitable data is available, it may significantly reduce the cost and duration of the contract. Please identify all data relevant to the product and its use being assessed. And then it says this, the data should contain an accurate and detailed description of the samples used and should have been produced within the last three years. So is it right that in terms of this appli these application forms uh, and this application process that the BBA would only accept data that was produced within the last three years? Our current position is that the figure is five years, not three. I'm not sure at what point that changed, but yes, that is what it says. Do you remember for how long it was three years for? When, when did that change to five take place? To be honest, it's, it's more, I don't remember it ever having been three years. I think it's always been five. I think this may be a very old form. I see. And um, it, it's right, isn't it, that that may have been a reason for Arconic not to have sent, for example, 1997 data on the Rainer Bond 160 PE test, because we see that statement there about the last three years, yes? Yes. Yeah, so whether it was three or five, I don't think we would have accepted data from 1997 at this point. Right. If we look at your first witness statement, page 16, BBA 50158, page 16, and, and in particular at paragraph 66. We see this, you say, um, Dr. Lane states that it's good industry practice to review the relevance of fire tests that are more than five years old. 
She notes that at the time of the second issue of the certificate in 2017, the class naught test reports were at least 11 years old. I exhibit as part of one of your exhibits, a copy of the 2017 certificate. And then you say this, the BBA did not require retesting after five years because there had been no changes to the regulatory requirements and the BBA operates a surveillance process, which is intended to establish whether product manufacturing has changed. And then you go on, the principle that the BBA follows is that if the composition and specification of the product is unchanged, the performance of the materials can also be expected to be unaltered. The manufacturer is obliged by our contractual arrangements to notify us of any changes. In this way, we seek to ensure that the validity of data are maintained. Now, we will come back to the second issue of the certificate in 2017 later, but what I wanted to focus on now is the BBA's approach to historic fire test data. You say there that the BBA does not require retesting after five years, and yet your application form requires test data within the last three years. Can you account for that difference in approach? As part of the initial assessment of a product, we would expect any data supplied to be less than, I believe it's five years old, it, it may then have been three years old. Because we have the product post certification under close production surveillance, we can be sure that the composition, formulation, specification are unchanged and therefore the product should be identical to that that was originally assessed. If that is the case there is no reason to suppose that the performance would be any different if an identical product was retested and I think that this five-year period of validity is imposed because of the likelihood of change of formulation and specification over time. Our surveillance process should eliminate that possibility and therefore we can continue to accept the existing data. I see. But it's right, isn't it, that your surveillance is directed at the manufacturing process and it wouldn't necessarily pick up if there had been fire testing within that period, which for example, contradicted earlier fire tests. That isn't the purpose of the factory surveillance, no. No. Mr Chairman, I think that would be a, a very good moment for, for our break this afternoon. It, yes, all right. Um, <clears throat> well, Mr Alvin, I said we'd have a break during the afternoon and so we shall, we'll have it now. We'll come back and continue your evidence, please, at half past three. And while we're on our break, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything to do with it. All right? Yes. Thank you very much. We'll see you at half past three then. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We are now ready to continue with Mr. Alban's evidence. So I'll just check, Mr. Alban, you can see me, I hope, and hear me. Yes, I can. Good. Thank you very much. And you're ready to carry on? Yes. Thank you. Well, then, Ms. Grange, when you're ready. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can we go back now to the BBA certificate again, BBA 6047 at page 5? And we, if we could blow up the top of section six, behavior in relation to fire again, we were looking at 6.2 and the uh, class naught um, evidence for the fire retardant sample of the product. I now want to focus on the top paragraph 6.1. It, it states there a standard sample of the product with a gray green Duogloss 5000 coating when tested for reaction to fire achieved a classification of BS2D0 in accordance with the EN13501-2002. A fire retardant sample of the product with a gold colored Durogloss finish when tested for reaction to fire achieved a classification BS1D0 in accordance with EN13501-2002. I want to focus on what uh, underpinned those statements in 6.1. If we go to the technical file now, this is BBA 408042 at page 147. This is the CSTB classification report to EN 13501. And the document we can see is number RA 053058A, and we've been calling this classification 5A. Um, and we can see if we go on, um, sorry, on that page under commercial brands. So we've got owner is Alcoa Architectural Products, and underneath that it says commercial brand, and it says Rainabon 55PE riveted system. Do you see that? Yes. And then if we go to page 149, under section two, the product description, it says composite panel consisting of a low density polyethylene core thermally bonded using a 70 micron thick polyethylene film between two pre-coated aluminium sheets. And then the tested system underneath that, it says riveted on metallic substructure. And at the bottom, we can see the color is gray green. And then if we go to page 153, we can see that classification of BS2D0 for that panel. So that's the PE riveted panel. Now, this CSTB report was the basis for the first sentence of paragraph 6.1 of the certificate. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And the second sentence of paragraph 6.1, which relates to a fire retardant uh, sample of the product, if we go now to the BBA technical file page, so it's the same file, page 155, this is a separate reaction to fire classification report from the CSTB, this time number RA063072 in that top uh, heading there. And we can see that under commercial brands, after, under own, after owner, we've got commercial brands again, and this is for the Rainer Bond FR product. And if we can go within this separate report to page 157, we see the product description. And we've got that description and then tested system riveted on metal substructure. Do you see that? Yes. And the color is gold colored there. 
And if we go to the final page of the report, page 161, we can see the classification there of B, S1, D, naught. Now that CSTB report is the basis of the second sentence of paragraph 6.1 in the certificate, isn't it? Yes. And we know that Arconic did a reaction to fire test on Rainabon PE cassette in late 2004. That was the single burning item test to, to EN 13823. And that was terminated when the heat release rate got too high. We just look briefly at that test report. That's at ARC 50536. We can see the test there and the number this time is RA 05305B and we've been calling this test 5B. And we can see on the front that this is not a classification report, it's merely a test report to EN 13823. And at the top right, someone's written um, K7 system, which we think was a shorthand for cassette system, not classified because the test had to be interrupted. And if we look briefly on page three, we can see this is for the cassette system. Yeah, under commercial brands, it's got Rainabon PE cassette system. And on page seven, we're told that only one specimen was tested. And under the table, there are comments. And in bold, it tells us that the test was stopped after 850 seconds. The results are not usable, but give an idea of the fire behavior of the product. And um, if we could look at your first witness statement again, this is on page 11, paragraph 40. You, um, you, you say this, you say Dr. Lane has included CSDTB report, and then we can see it's the 5B report that we were just looking at relating to the Rainabon 55 PE cassette. This report was not made available to the BBA at the time of the initial assessment or subsequently, and the disclosure of her appendix, not, uh, appendix O, sorry, is the first time that we've been aware of its existence. Dr. Lane noted that this report was unclassified, noting, however, results could be used to demonstrate class E. This means that Alcoa was aware that the cassette version should have been classified as E at the time of the initial BBA assessment. They also had a report at the same time, test 5A, that showed that the riveted version of the product was, a, was class B. Only the latter report was submitted to the BBA. And as far as we can tell, that is correct. There is no evidence that test 5B was uh, sent to you. Um, but in terms of the classification reports that that were sent, um, as we've just seen, each of them had a field of application. Perhaps we can just bring that back up. If I, if I can bring up on the left-hand side, BBA 408042 at page 153. And on the right-hand side, if we could bring up in the same document run, BBA 408042, page 161. Now, um, so what we can see is underneath the classification that each of these tests get is a heading 4.3 called field of application. We look on the left-hand side first, it says field of application. This classification is valid for the following product parameters for a thickness of four millimeters. And then underneath that, it says this only for the system riveted on any metallic substructure. Do you see that, Mr. Alban? Yes. And we see on the right-hand side, field of application, it's actually in slightly different, but the same intent is there. We can see under the second underlying heading, this classification is valid for the following end use conditions we see it says riveted system on metal substructure. Now, can we agree they're slightly different, but in both cases, it is made clear that the classification report that the results 
relate to is only valid for the product in rivet fabrication. Can we agree that? Yes. So does it follow, and again, can we agree that the results quoted in the certificate, these certificates cannot be applied to the cassette end use condition? Do you accept that? From this information, we don't know what the performance of the cassette version was, but from the information subsequently disclosed, yes, I would agree. And sorry if I can interrupt for a moment, Ms. Grange, but Mr. Alban, not, neither of these reports relate to tests on a raw panel, is that right? No, they are the panels in riveted form. And so I don't know whether that affects their value if you're seeking to produce a confirmation certificate for a raw panel. I think the European classification system requires that the products are tested in a configuration that is representative of that which will be applied in practice. Well, so you can okay. test it in this way. Yeah, that, that I understand, but it still remains the case that these are not tests on a raw panel, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, Ms. Grange, thank you. Yes, precisely. Uh, uh, and so <clears throat> it follows, doesn't it, that the moment these test results were cited in the certificate, you had departed, if this was the intention, from the raw panel and into the fabricated product, yes? Yes, there is an inconsistency. Yes. And indeed, if you had been confining the certificate to just the raw product, no European test classification could have been cited, could it? No. Should a BBA project manager reading this information, we have it up in front of us, have understood that the European classifications for the Rainer Bond product were limited by their fabrication form? I would have expected the project manager to recognise the facts this only applied to the riveted system and to ask the question. Yes. And that question would be, or one of the questions would be, uh, where is the data for your cassette version of your product, yes? Yes. And that should have been asked for, shouldn't it? Yes. Thank you. And just to be clear, this information put the BBA project manager on notice that there might be another test for the cassette fabrication condition. Can we agree that too? Yes. And given that these classification reports um, say what they say, shouldn't the BBA certificate have expressly referred to this limitation in the section 6.1 that we've looked at? I it should have said that the classifications of B that we see here only applied to the riveted system, yes? Yes. And that would have been a true and correct reflection of the data as presented to you, yes? Yes. Now, if we just look at your first statement, we go to BBA 50158, page 12, at paragraph 43. You say this, you say, no fire test data for the cassette version in the 2008 certificate was presented to the BBA this led to the reasonable assumption that the riveted version was representative of both versions. Had test data noted in Dr. Lane's report been available to the BBA, then this assumption would have been avoided. Now, that was the evidence you, you gave in your first witness statement. I've taken you now to the underlying test data and the limitations of it that were provided to the BBA. Do you maintain that the, it was a reasonable assumption that the riveted version was representative of both versions, or do you now accept that that was not a reasonable assumption? 
I think that the manufacturer made no, no distinction in their technical literature. They made no distinction in their application. And an assumption was made on that basis. I would agree if the field of application had been noted, there would have been good reason to ask a further question. Yes, and can, can we also agree that the field of application should have been noted? Yes. Those were the very test reports that Arconic were relying on for its uh, fire performance information in this certificate. Those field of application limitations should have been noted, shouldn't they? Yes. And it was, wasn't it, the project manager's job to check precisely that information and ensure that the certificate was accurate in terms of what it stated on fire performance, yes? Yes. This forms a large part of the training we currently apply to project managers. Yes, so does it follow from your answer that, that there's been a recognition within the BBA that the training that was applied to project managers at this time was deficient? It's clear that this particular project manager did not understand it. I don't know what training he was provided with because as I've explained, at that time it was less formalized and on the job but we have eliminated that possibility recurring by putting additional measures in place. Yes, I mean, isn't it possible that this stems from the structural deficiency I was putting to you earlier, that you have project managers with, with very little knowledge or expertise in fire performance, having to look at data just like that, that we've just looked at, and determine what fire performance statements should be made. Isn't it that structural deficiency that may be in part at least responsible for why this situation occurred? As we discuss, I, I don't think Mr. Gregorian had any competence in the area of fire assessment. I don't know who carried out the fire assessment on this particular job, it's not clear. I would have expected somebody with an understanding of the principles to carry out that part of the assessment. Yes. And um, wouldn't one option, had this de test data have been um, appreciated, wouldn't one option have been to remove all references to the cassette version of the product in the certificate in circumstances where no fire test data was provided for that? That would have been one option. There are others, but yes, that would be one. Can you help as to why that was not done at any stage prior to the Grenfell fire? No, I don't know. Do you accept that by leaving references to the cassettes in the certificate, the reader would be left with the impression that paragraph 6.1 applied to both the rivet and the cassette fixing methods? Yes. And indeed that was the understanding of Miss Amoroso when she came to look at this certificate in her 2016 review, she's told us in her oral evidence that at that stage, she thought that if the cassette was not removed, readers would be misled into thinking it was covered by the certificate. That was day 106, page 16196 to 10. Do you agree with that? We come back again to what was actually intended to be covered in that certificate, but I would agree that the fact there is a difference between riveted and cassette is not clear from that certificate. And it should have been clear, yes. Depending on what the scope of that certificate was, I, I don't believe we intended to cover the riveted and cassette options, but it is not clear from that certificate. Yes, thank you. I think you're drawing a distinction between perhaps what the BBA in, intended to try and do with the certificate and what the certificate itself actually conveys, yes? I think there is the opportunity for confusion as to the scope of that certificate, yes. Yes, um, Mr. Nakomo's evidence was very similar to Ms. Amoroso's. He accepted that removal of the references to cassette later was necessary because readers might think the certificate covered cassette. Uh, again, um, was he right about that? I think that was more to do with the surveillance processes over the 
cassette manufacture in that we did not have it under surveillance. We did not have the fabrication process under surveillance. Yeah. Can we agree that um, one of the key European tests, the single burning item test, EN 13823, um, is, is a test which is key to determining whether the product gets a B, a C or a D. Yes, yes. can we agree that? Yes. And um, would you have expected project managers and those supervising them to have been aware of that uh, at the time this certificate was being put together? Yes. And um, if we just look at that European test standard, I don't think we've looked at it before, 13823, it's a BSA, BSI 50119. This is the test standard for the single burning item test you can see that at the end of that title it's a reaction to fire test for building products building products excluding floorings exposed to the thermal attack by a single burning item and if you go to page 15 of this test standard at section 5.2 we can see there at the bottom 5.2 mounting of specimen and under 5.2.1 when products are tested mounted as in their end use application, the test results are valid only for that application. So, um, and can we agree that anybody with familiarity of this European fire testing system would have appreciated that this key test, the single burning item test, is only carried out in an end use application. So i.e. on a on a riveted or a cassette version of the Rainerbond product, yes? Yes, I think I just said that, yes. Yes. And I think you make the point yourself in your own statement, um, paragraph 129 of your second statement for the transcript, you make the point there that the European tests better represent real world conditions because joints and edges are incorporated in the test, yes? Yes. Did you know that throughout the period we're dealing with, i.e. from 2007 onwards? European standard methods are, were quite new in 2007. I'm not sure that I would have known in 2007 unless I had occasion to look at a report. Um, I'm not sure when I looked at the first report, but whenever that first report was presented, I would have familiarised myself with it. Yes, and would you have expected project managers when these reports were presented to have familiarized themselves with the standards underpinning it, certain for the, certainly for this key test, this single burning item test? We're not a test laboratory. I wouldn't necessarily have expected them to understand all the details of the test method, certainly the principles I would expect, and I would expect them to pay attention to the field of application of the classification or test report. But, but you say I wouldn't necessarily have expected them to understand all the details of the test method. I appreciate there might be some details that may be too far, but given that the BBA is certifying fitness for purpose of these panels, wouldn't you have expected them to have understood how these test methods go about testing these panels and in particular that they test them in real world conditions? I would expect them to understand that principle, yes. Yes. So in circumstances where you had a rivet test, rivet test data, again, can we agree that for that reason too, it should have occurred to the BBA that Arconic were likely also to have tested the cassette fix variant? I keep coming back to the scope of the assessment. But I don't think we were intending to convey convey an assessment of the assess uh, sorry of the cassette and riveted versions but if we were then yes we should have expected there to be two different tests 
or classifications. Yes, but I think we've agreed that the moment you descended in section six fire performance into the European tests, you were by definition entering into an assessment of cassette or rivet, not a flat panel. If we were representing the European classification and it applied only to rivet, we should have said so. Yes. Can we look at another document that was provided by Arconic? Um, if we go within the technical file, that's BBA 408042 to page uh, 139. Here we can see, uh, this is classification report number RA070182. And we can see in the middle of this page under commercial brands, this is a classification of the Raynolux product. And if we go to page 141 under product description, we can see that uh, effectively it's describing the Raynolux product, aluminium sheet coated on the backside with a poly polyester resin back coat and then with a primer and polyester finishing coat. Now, that is effectively a solid in aluminium panel with no core. That's right, isn't it? Yes, I think so. And if we go to page 145, we can see that that Reno Lux solid aluminium panel achieved a European classification of A1. So that, that information was also on the, on the technical file. And we know that that came to be on the technical file because Mr. Gregorian was seeking data showing that the unexposed side of the panels was uh, class naught. And we know that our conic, Mr. Verle, sent this Raynolux certificate. Um, if we can go now, to page 499 of this uh, technical file, same document run. We can see in the top email there on the 5th of December, 2007, that Mr. Verle sends to Mr. Gregorian a, the Raynolux, this Raynolux A1 PDF, which is this same document, the Raynolux certificate. And Mr. Verle says, hello, Hamo, after checking after having checked with our paint laboratory and the different certification we have today, I give you those two information in order to qualify the back face of our Rainabon panels. Uh, he says at item one, the only difference between front and back side is the thickness of the coating, which is six microns instead of 35 microns. So we have 4.2 grams per meter square coating weight on the back face of 47.2 grams per meter squared on the front side. And then he says this, at at item two, like you can see in the attached reaction to fire classification report number RA070182, our coated aluminium used for the skins of Rainer Bond are classified as A1 non-combustible. And then can you please now let me know if you have all the required information to close our certification process. And we heard during the oral evidence of Mr. Gregorian that this topic was referred to Sarah Colwell at the BRE. If we can look at the BBA certificate um, on this point, if we go to BBA 6047, page five, we can see at section 6.3, in the very last sentence, it says there, the unexposed side of the products may also be regarded as having a class naught surface. Can you see that in the last sentence? Yes. Can we take it from that, that someone at the BBA on advice or otherwise thought that it was acceptable to use a Raynolux certificate to support a claim that the back face of the Raynabon panel may be regarded as class naught. I'm afraid I don't know the basis for that conclusion. So you can't help us as to why 
what appears to have happened is that data in relation to a different product has been used in relation to that statement. I think the coil coating, the subject of the, the other BBA certificate is, is used to form the outer and inner faces um, enclosing the polyethylene, but that's speculation, I don't know. Right. So, um, can you help us as to why the BBA accepted a Rayner Lux certificate to make this statement about the Rayner Bond product? Well, if it is a component of that product, it, there may be someone made that judgment. I, I'll say I, I don't know, I'm afraid. If it's right that the Rayner Lux certificate can be used for the back face, then does it follow that Rayner Lux could have been used to support claims about the front face? Sorry, I, I don't know the basis for the conclusion. I can't help you. I'm speculating. Was relying on a Rayner Lux certificate in this way, contrary to the approach which should have been adopted, had proper processes been followed? I can't answer that without knowing the process that was actually followed. Well, let's look at some email chains because you did have some involvement with this issue. If we can go to BBA, three zeros, one zero seven zero one. And if we can look at uh, page four, this is an email chain on the 20th of November, 2007 between you, Mr. Gregorian and Mr. Haynes. And if we pick it up at the top of page four, in that email there timed at 13.54. What we can see is Mr. Gregorian saying to Mr. Haynes, you're not on the email at this point. He says, um, Brian, the back face is also a coil coated sheet of the same thickness as the front, but with a polyurethane or epoxy primer coating only about 20 microns thick for improved corrosion resistance. It's worth noting that our certificate for Bequitech 5000, which has an identical primer, the back face has been given the same class naught rating as the front. And then he goes on, as to whether we are making too much of this, I think we are. However, John Alban will need to consider this when looking at the coil coated sheet contract, a separate project. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you know what he's referring to there by the coil coated sheet contract? I don't know. It may well be this was the subject of, I think we called it meeting A, where they were looking to add to the scope of the coil coating certificate. At the bottom of page three, in an email timed at uh, 3.16, we can see that you are copied in. And um, Mr. Haynes says back to Mr. Gregorian, Hamo, I'm not sure it will arise in the same way for John's job. For you, there's a specific requirement to declare the reaction to fire performance of the back face of the rain screen. I assume John's sheet is multi-purpose and the back face may well not be exposed. An opinion from Warrington will be acceptable for the back face in my view. And then, if we go to the top of page three, you then reply at uh, 1525, you say this, you say um, to, to Mr. Haynes and Mr. Gregorian, for what it's worth, we always make a comment on the reaction to fire performance of the reverse side of a coil coating. And then above that, Mr. Haynes says this, in the bottom of page two now. He asks, it asks you back, just you, and how often does it differ from the front face? And then if we go on in the chain, you say back to him, in my experience, the reverse sides are always class naught, but then so are the face sides, exclamation mark. And then I'm gonna ask you some questions about that in a moment, but just let me just finish this, this chain, this run, and then I'll ask the questions. If we then go up to page one, second email from the top, 
Yes. Um, Mr. Haynes says back to you, John, I can't see we're running any serious risk if we make this assumption based on experience. What do you think, Brian? And then at the very top of the chain, you say, I would be amazed if the coating isn't class naught, but can't see what we're gaining by not asking them to prove it. It also seems unfair to other certificate holders who have commissioned the necessary test. Could we compromise by proceeding to issue, but asking them to provide the confirmatory data retrospectively? Now, just with that chain in mind, where you said that the reverse and face sides would always be class naught, were you talking about coil coated products as per your previous email? Yes. I don't think I said always. I think I said in my experience, but yes, it would be coil coatings, yes. And would you describe Rainer Bond as a coil coated product? No, but it has the intermediate polyethylene core. It includes coil coated material, but it is not in itself a coil coated material. No. So would you expect that both the front and the reverse of the Rainerbond panels would have achieved class naught? Is that what you were saying in this string? It's not clear. Um, it, I assume we know the performance of these coatings as core coating materials. And we are discussing the possible influence of inserting a poly polyethylene core. Yes. And how would you know what the fire performance of that composite product would be without testing it to 476 part six and part seven, i.e. The, the tests that are necessary before it can be established whether it does have class knowledge or not? Well, we would have tested them to BS 476 part six and seven to establish that the coil coatings are class naught. Yes, but what about the composite product? Why are you speculating here that a product with a polyethylene core might behave in the same way as the coil coated product? Because by the nature of the test, the, the panel is cut out, the cores are not exposed, and I would expect it to have little influence, but I am not certain, which is why I'm suggesting we should carry out a test. Yes, you said in that last email that you couldn't see anything that would be lost by asking Arconic to prove this by class naught on the back face with test evidence. Did you subsequently come to learn that the Rainerlux certificate was apparently accepted as being sufficient evidence of this without Arconic providing that separate test data for the Rainerbond product? I was providing advice to the BBA technical manager on request. It was his decision as to what actions were taken as a result of that advice. Yes, but did you subsequently come to learn that in fact, the Rainer Lux certificate was accepted as being sufficient without Arconic providing that separate test data? No. So was the first time you were made aware of that when you saw the technical file for the purposes of uh, assisting the inquiry? I think so, yes. I, I don't remember this correspondence. Obviously, I don't dispute it, but this is the first time I can recall it. Um, I don't recall any subsequent correspondence or conversation about it. So you can't help us as to why that test evidence wasn't insisted upon by the BBA as per the view you're expressing here? I don't know. Now, while we're on this point, can we look at um, BBA 408042, page 507? This is an email from um, Mr. Gregorian to Sarah Colwell. If we go to the page before, I think we can see the date. Um, yes, so 29th of November, 2007, right at the bottom of the page, 1740, from Mr. Gregorian to Sarah Colwell, copying in Brian Haynes, 
the subject is reaction to fire rain screen cladding. And if we could go to the email now, um, he, he says this, he says, Dear Sarah, we are currently assessing a composite panel comprising two aluminium sheets bonded to a polyethylene core for use in back ventilated and drained rain screen cladding systems. The panel is coated on both faces with a six micron thick polyester primer. The exposed face is additionally protected by a 30 micron thick Duragloss or PVDF coating. Based on testing and classification to EN 13501 part one and BS 476 part six and seven, the exposed face has been assessed as having a class naught surface in relation to approved document B of the building regulations. As I'm sure you're aware, for buildings other than dwellings, the regulations also require classification of the surface facing the cavity, clause 12.9. No test data for the back face exists. However, as it has a much thinner coating and therefore less energy content than the exposed face, we think it's not unreasonable to assume a class naught rating for the back face too. This has indeed been demonstrated by tests on similar products in the past. Could you please comment on the validity of our assumption? So that, that's the request. Now, I just want to focus on the, the sentence about a third of the way down that paragraph that I just read, which reads, based on testing and classification to EN 13501 and BS 476, part six and seven, the exposed face has been assessed as having a class naught surface in relation to approved document B. Now, can we agree that that sentence gives the impression that all the panels have been assessed as having a class naught surface according to those standards? Can we, can we agree that that's how it reads? Um, well, it's in singular, isn't it? So presumably a panel was tested. Yes, but the reality, wasn't it, that it was only the FR panel that had uh, achieved class nought under the 476 part six and part seven, yes? Yes. And not the standard PE panel. Yes. Now, wasn't that potentially information that Ms. Colwell ought to have been aware of when seeking advice? Yes. So can we agree that even though Mr. Gregorian is trying to take some advice on the back face point, he is inaccurately summarising the position for Ms. Colwell in this email? Yes, but Sarah Colwell would not make a judgment on the basis of this email. This is an introductory email. If she were to make a technical assessment, she would, I am sure, require all of the data to be provided to her. Well, we don't know that. All that we know is that Mr. Gregorian has told us that there was a conversation with Mr. Haynes on the phone with Ms. Colwell, uh, at which this point was discussed. And we have no written documentation suggesting that data was passed to Ms. Colwell and that there was a formal fire opinion that came back. So um, we don't know that that happened. Can we agree that? Yes. Now, just concentrating on this email, doesn't this email demonstrate the problem with having project managers who are wholly inexperienced in fire matters, taking the lead on drafting certificates and deciding when they do and when they don't need fire advice? I think with respect, it's Brian Haynes that's asked Hamo Gregorian to get in touch with Sarah Colwell. I think it's a case where Brian Haynes needed additional information and perhaps it would have been better if Brian himself had sent this email, in which case it would have been more accurate. But I think it's slightly different to the position you're suggesting. Well, you're speculating, are you not, about if Brian had sent the email, whether it would have been more accurate? I am, but we, it has been suggested that Brian and Sarah had a conversation at some point, so I think he was involved. Yes, but whether it was whether Brian saw this or not, the basis upon which advice is being requested is erroneous. It, it's not an accurate statement of the true position in this request for advice. And what I'm suggesting to you is that exemplifies 
the problem of having project managers, whether overseen by Mr. Haynes or not, taking the lead on drafting certificates and deciding when they do and when they don't need fire advice? I don't think he took the lead on the fire section and I don't think he made the decision as to whether or not fire advice was required. I do agree that this email could have been better written. Yes, well, whether or not he took the lead on it and actually made the decision, he is summarising the position for Ms Colwell in this email and he's inaccurately done so, yes? It's incomplete. I think the additional data would have been required to carry out the assessment. Well, it, it's not just incomplete, is it? It's misleading because it suggests that there's 476 part six and seven data for all of the panels, when in fact it was only the FR panel that had that data. I agree only the FR panel had the data. This only talks about one of the panels. And so until Sarah Colwell or another expert had a chance to review the complete set of data, that would not be clear. Yes, but um, it, it's clear from these exchanges that he's not just seeking advice about the back face of the FR panel, is he? He's seeking advice generally. Yes. Yes, thank you. Mr Chairman, um, I appreciate it's nine minutes um, before 4.30. Um, yes. I, I don't really want to start the next topic uh, and then go part heard on it, if that makes sense. So um, I'm doing well for time, better than I expected. All right. Um, I'm confident that we are comfortable for time. So um, I would rather do the next run of questions in one go um, on Monday morning, if that's acceptable. Yes, I understand. Well, it may be that Mr. Albon won't mind finishing a little bit early this afternoon. Mr. Albon, you've heard what council said. I think we will uh, call a halt at that point. Um, I think you were expecting to come back next week, weren't you? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm sorry to, to have to bring you back, but there are more questions we need to ask you. So we will resume at 10 o'clock on Monday, please. Again, I must remind you uh, not to talk to anyone about your evidence or anything relating to it over the intervening period. And we'll look forward to seeing you 10 o'clock, as I say, next week on Monday. OK, thank you. Thank you. And, and for everybody else, that's the end of the proceedings for today. Thank you very much.